Hello, this is uh, PCR TV. My name is Juan Kornofsky from uh, Israel. And with me here, uh, Dr. Helge Mollmann from Dartmouth, Germany, and uh, Dr. Alec Vahenian from Paris, France. Hello to both of you. Uh, the topic of today is uh, transcatheter mitral valve implantation. Uh, we are going to discuss some uh, preliminary results and techniques. And I would like to uh, start uh, with you, Alec, to present the issue of the target population. Who are the candidates for transcatheter mitral valve implantation procedures? Thanks, Ron, for this question. You know, 100, 150 patients treated, it's extremely difficult to give any precise and definite statement. Let's envisage who could be this patient. I think this patient should be discussed within the heart team, which could be, should be extended, that is to say, include cardiologists, but also cardiac surgeon, heart failure specialist, EP specialist, and imaging specialist. Definitely, there will be, to start with, high-risk or inoperable patient from the clinical standpoint. As regards anatomy, uh, there are patients who are not candidates for valve repair, not good candidates. We can imagine in primary MR, the rheumatic, the hyperbolo, the calcified valve. In the field of secondary, the patient with a very important lack of coaptation, but we should not take the patient who are nearly to die with extremely depressed LV function and or extremely depressed right ventricular function. That's my guess for today. So mostly high risk patients, but not too high risk. No, no, not, not uh, too advanced. Yeah. No. Thank you, Alec. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, Helge, about the preparations needed for the procedure and especially the imaging part of the preparation. Yeah, when, when we try to find the perfect patient for uh, transcatheter mitral valve um, replacement, um, then we definitely have to rely on, on imaging. Um, the mitral space is much more complicated than um, the aortic space. The aortic valve is uh, just a round valve and it's pretty easy to find uh, the, the correct device. We have a lot of experience here. And in the mitral space, it's um, somehow different. So we cannot only rely on um, uh, TTE, as the surgeons do before um, mitral valve um, uh, repair. We have to find a, a multimodality imaging. So it's TTE to first screen the patients, TOE, um, and especially 3D TOE to get a better understanding on what's going on. And then, of course, um, the CT is of utmost importance. The CT gives us the perfect measurements um, and gives us an impression on the um, surrounding structures. TMVR um, may have some problems, for example, with the LVOT. Um, if there is an obstruction of the LVOT afterwards, uh, we don't win anything by just rep um, repairing the mitral valve. And therefore, the 3D capabilities of the CT are very important to really figure out upfront which valve uh, will perfectly, perfectly fit to which patient. What can you tell us about the devices that uh, obtain some clinical experiences? First of all, um, there are um, a couple of devices around. A couple of devices have been presented um, during uh, this year PCR course. Um, but we have to be very clear that only four devices entered uh, the um, clinical arena somehow. None of the devices are readily available, so we are at very early stages right now. And the devices we are talking about right now are um, self-expanding devices. They um, have different modes of action, um, unique for all devices is uh, that they are um, out of nitinol and the nitinol tries to perfectly fit into the um, mitral valve um, space. Um, there are devices which try to accommodate mitral space perfectly by a D-shape, yet there are other devices which are round. And one common feature is uh, that all devices are three leaflet um, devices. So this is somehow different from nature. Uh, everybody knows a mitral valve was designed to be bicuspid. And therefore, um, this is a um, difference. And we have to learn whether the um, three leaflet design is really the perfect design for, for the mitral space. Alec, uh, what do we know about the preliminary clinical results and how many patients are we talking about? 
Well, as uh, Helge said, we are talking about something 100, 150 patients, so very, very early stage, and we don't know everything. And this morning, I and Mary did made a very nice presentation, sum, summing up what we know. And the largest series is around 30, but we know about 20, just to, to give you an example. Well, uh, about the four or five devices where we have some data, uh, what we know is that they are performing highly selected patients. That's very important. He said, well, it could be one out of 10 patients proposed are finally selected, which is good. Because in the very early days, the very early 10 or 20 patients, fatality was 50% because of poor patient selection, almost dead, no LV, they died. So now, with a very careful selection in highly experienced centers, mortality is low. The procedure is mostly performed in all but two cases via transapical approach. And via transapical approach, with a very careful imaging screening and very expert um, surgeons and cardiologists working under T guidance, they end up with a fast procedure. It's uh, less than 30 minutes, sometimes 15, 20 minutes. So speedy procedure, good results in terms of reduction of MR. MR is eliminated in almost all the cases, very good. The intravalvular gradient seems to be low. As Olga said, there are some cases of LVOT obstruction, but doesn't seem many. And thereafter, we have some data at 30 days showing the stability of the results, no catastrophe. And when patient died, but mostly due to their to advanced cardiac condition or extra cardiac condition, no dramatic signals as regard very early thrombosis, but what can we say from such a limited series? Let's say great improvement since uh, PCR last year or the year before where it was a catastrophe. Okay, thank you very much. This was very interesting. I would even say exciting. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Ron.